First, let me say, be the first of probably many to say thank you all for being here this evening. It's an honor to stand here in front of the people that I love and people that I don't know but probably would love. <laughs> thank you also to our esteemed readers for agreeing to provide us with an evening of words tonight and to the organizers who made this reading possible. I will aim for brevity here so that we can get to the good stuff, the poetry. But please allow me first to tell you a little bit about Irena Praetis. Dutifully, I must inform you first that Praetis is the author of five books, three of her own poetry and one a collection of prose vignettes, as well as co-translating a collection of the work of a Lithuanian poet. She's an alum of our MFA program here at ASU, which she completed after having already obtained her PhD. She's also a professor of literature and creative writing at California State University Fullerton, and her work has appeared in the Mid-America Poetry Review, Denver Quarterly, International Poetry Review, and many, many, many more. She's a Fulbright scholar, and of course her work has been nominated for a pushcart. Her most recent collection, The Last Stone in the Circle, won the Red Mountain Poetry Prize. But beyond this, I'd like to share with you something that I read in an interview that she gave with Jennifer Givon because I feel like this captures who I believe she must be as a person, as a poet, primarily because she was speaking about her son. She assures in this same piece that everything she says and does is interwoven, interconnected. But then she goes on to say of her son, quote, his concentration makes me more aware of how much there is to notice in any given moment. When we sit together quietly, he shows me how much can be conveyed by presence and just being. He repeatedly makes me realize all of the ways that we come to be and how amazing the journey of our lives is. And this is how I see the last stone in the circle. This is not a view inside, it's a view from the inside. It asks, in a tone reserved for the pew, what is the course of humanity? Pridus moves us through a re-education camp in World War II, but the gaze is not one of being looked upon. It is one of looking out from this camp, through the eyes of, through the actions of, those who reside behind the walls and the fences. I know I will never look on bread the same way again. So this may surprise you, but as an MFA student, I read a lot of poetry. Rarely, however, has a collection devastated me, like the last stone in the circle. I won't offer spoilers, but I am struck by the comments about her son, and the connection that bears to my experience of this collection. As Praetis said of her son, we are here, sitting together quietly. And these poems show us how much can be conveyed by our presence. They will make you realize the ways that we've come to be and how amazing is the journey of our lives. And I hope that you will join me in giving an enthusiastic welcome back to Irena Praetis. Wow, thank you so much for that, Cheyenne. Um, I don't know that I've ever heard an introduction that almost made me cry um, in a good way. <laughs> Maybe the other way. Um, but I, I, also, <laughs> um, I also very much want to thank everybody uh, for being here uh, and for giving a, a small time of your part of your life uh, to this evening uh, and to the poems and just to being here together in celebration of poetry. Um, I know there are a lot of big, loud things going on in the world right now, but I strongly believe that it's these small moments of gathering and celebration that in the long run speak louder and that have the worth and meaning to last beyond the immediate explosions and the loud noises that are occurring. So thank you for being part of that and thank you for being here and, and for being already, I can tell, a great audience. Um, I want to begin uh, just by saying that uh, this book is dedicated, and so this reading also, uh, to my brother. And I want to begin by reading the prologue, which was my way into this collection. Thank you for your patience. According to the documentation we have found, Alexander Misevich, born in Vilkia on October 17, 1908, died at Rumhild on April 7, 1944. 
His cause of death was listed as tuberculosis. He is buried in the Waldfriedhof in Rumhild. We have now completed our research on this request, September 5th, 2011. Section one, epigraph. We were received by the camp commandant who told us with the help of an interpreter, the camp Rumhild is not like Buchenwald. It goes faster here. This opening poem is based on an eyewitness account. And the eyewitness said, I saw the Chinese prisoner lying on the floor with his throat cut. Cord. Listen. Music travels far on quiet nights. Open the windows. Enjoy another man's opera, your neighbor's wife singing at her bath. Listen, death can't not be musical. Pickaxes clanging, capos beating, one last breath guttering the throat of the no longer living. Listen for my entrance. I've timed it beautifully. I can't breathe. We string words. Winter robins hunting seeds. One word, answers. Two words, a plea. Three pearls in a chokehold. Rest in peace. Uh, this next poem is part of a series of poems that um, are placed throughout the collection. This is actually um, a broken sonnet crown. Um, and so if you were to read through, you could put them all back together. Um, and it's not a nice, perfect, beautiful crown. Um, it's jarred and in pieces and kind of scattered and not aligned the right way. But given the subject, that seemed to be the thing to do with the crown. And it's called The Finer Things, Portrait of a Couple. You expect fine things, rich food, rare wine, soft clothes, long baths, me too. Here, luxury means sleeping off the floor, a few more grams of bread, a sturdy pair of shoes. You grow accustomed to the thud a truncheon makes, the shock a kick sends up your leg. Not that I like it. No, no, I'm not some sadist. I made a choice between beating and being beaten. Who wouldn't? No back-breaking work, more soup, warmer feet come winter, surviving to see spring. Don't think I am not you. Um, this next poem was based also on an eyewitness account. And in the eyewitness account, it said, um, a young Polish boy brought here with his father was made by the guards to dress up and dance as a clown. Clowns. If Papa finds out, he'll kill them. Then he'll be shot too, like Mama and Oscar. There's just the two of us now, so I say nothing about the guards who paint my face with soot. Black smile stretching my mouth, black nose, black eyebrows crowing above my own. Dance, little clown, dance, they taunt. I hunch, spring, hobble, like the men we watched on holidays who hit each other all about the head while we laughed until we cried. I hope some guardsman's duty will call them. 
but it never does. They stick bottles, broomsticks, and themselves in me, laughing, cursing, spitting, then feed me spoons of marmalade. Papa would be proud that I don't cry or show my fear. After, I wipe the black off with my sleeves and practice songs Mama and Oscar taught me. I sing for Papa, too tired to be angry at my clowning. One day, I'll be so good, I'll make him smile. Um, the main work occupation at the camp was digging in a basalt mine. Um, and the camp was started, the argument was made that um, this mine had gone dormant during the war because all of the people who had worked it had been called to the front. And so the mayor of the town of Rumhild was considered to be very enterprising in approaching um, the, the SS and saying, oh, you know what, we need a camp here because there's this, this mine that could be worked uh, to, to help promote the war effort. And so after a certain amount of negotiation, there was a startup and the determination was made that this would be what's called an Arbeits or Zihungslager, or a work re-education camp. Um, and so often, the most recalcitrant prisoners at um, the, the more standard, not that anything is standard about concentration camps, but the more known camp concentration camps like Buchenwald, if someone was having trouble working the way they were supposed to be working or following orders there, they were sent to an Arbeits or Zihungslager to learn how to be a good prisoner, a model prisoner. Um, and basically, um, they were working hard labor 12 to 14 hours a day on about 600 calories. Um, and so this is a poem uh, about one of the people who's working the mind, and it's called Take Us. I swing the sledge while working the mine. As we descend the rough sawn stairs, our work clogs thresh the fine wood grain. Starving men who cannot eat grain stairs offer. We reach the pit to scatter amidst the blasted basalt. I wonder while I work, what would the SS be without one S? I think I shift my grip and struck becomes the truck that drives me homeward. A rock slam on a guard can send me on the lamb or end me. Hands melt snow to spark the greening of spring now. No wind in sails ails me. I don't fret. Pearls before swine might still yield wine. One stone turn becomes the tone that sets me singing. Sweep away slights and sleep with sin. Hold love, skin deep. Sadist, redeemer, which would it be? if laughter rests one letter away from slaughter. When we think about wars and um, camps and these kinds of things, we often think about the people who are immediately part of them, who were actors within them. Um, and one of the things that I discovered in researching is that um, war casts a huge shadow. It's just, it's not just the people who are immediately there. It's everybody that they know and everybody that knows those people that they know. And it just keeps spreading farther and farther um, until there's just a huge impact and a huge effect. Uh, and this is a poem about um, one of the also ands. Thin skinned. Teasing drove her to tears. A neighbor's cold shoulder fluttered her for weeks. War scraped her thin. I read to her while her needle clicked buttons, pressed damp cloths to her forehead during bombing raids. I drove without permission after my neighbor called to say my sister spent all morning patting a bucket, clucking to chickens who were no longer there.
This poem is called Animals. <clears throat> the boy pleads, and I remember mother whipping me with the vacuum cord after she caught me making farting noises with friends. You're not an animal. Hide your dirt or you'll be buried in it. Small decencies designed to save us now cost us our lives. Come with me to ask, please. I need to go outside, he whines. Use the barrel, I snap. He starts to cry. A boy sent to fight, caught like the rest of us. I turn on the dirt floor, but listen for his voice. The night guard slaps him with the rifle as he begs. I hear his bowels loosen as the guard cocks the gun and fires, grunting with disgust. Seer. The mountain will bask, sun warmed and green, in the summer we won't see. The local innkeeper once advertised a fairy grotto in the sand cave where we store shovels to bury our dead. Beyond the barbed wire, gold leaves spin through shafts of sunlight. Leaves not snow. How we will ache when it comes from the cold for the sear beauty of it. Death. No hood, no scythe, no skeletal finger tap. No ill will, no sweet escape, no justice, no rhyme, no reason, no reckoning, no why, nothing human. Up against oblivion, who wouldn't insist on a person, some pernicious soul to shake a fist at, try and condemn, some force to bend toward our sense of purpose or fairness. Nothing's incomprehensible. Not enough presence for indifference. One blank we constantly finger, but never inscribe. Um, this will be the last poem that I read. Um, it's called Coda, and it has an epigraph at the beginning. On April 1st, 1945, injured and ill prisoners, unable to march, were separated from the main Rumheld Work Education Camp evacuation group, herded into a sand cave, shot at, and then sealed inside the mine shaft by an explosion. Leaning my crutch against the wall, I sink to the ground. I, the others, we learn the darkness. Only blind in sight, we feel our dead, lay them out, cross cracked hands over hearts. We hold the dying, those thrashing to find anchor. We quiet the frenzied digging, the exhausted weeping. We linger, a tangle of thoughts in the mind of the mountain. We no longer crawl to the back of the cave. Urine, feces, so many of our bowels diseased will die breathing in 
our piss and shit. We discover time for everything. The appetites of anger fade away. Those we loved might not know us, but we know each other. All the evils we live, the shreds of decency we never surrender. Vlad begins singing a scrap of tune from childhood, a song for lonely days, for skipping stones and carefree games. I remember the world I will not see and think of my son, how I made the choice each day to hold his helpless body in wonder and cleanse him with love. Thank you.